um, this is a folder, obviously, from Northwestern from way back. Um, I think I used it when I was, well, I've got my current sauce card in there, but I've got my notes um, about the, the night, and I actually found my original article um, on this thin paper from 1973. I'm glad I kept that. I found it in my attic the other day. Knowing what I know now, I wish that I had had more time to prepare and ask questions. No further ado, Jim Croce. My name is Melanie Babin Torbett. I grew up in Jonesville, Louisiana. I'm from Alexandria now. I was 19 years old when I interviewed Jim Croce, almost 20 actually, I was a senior. Um, I'm 68 years old now. Uh, Janet Tompkins, uh, in September 1973, I was the associate news editor for The Current Sauce, which basically meant I did the, assign the news things and I did the front page that had to be ready. Uh, where the, the other editor did the editorial page. So I had some layout duties at that time too. I'm Jerry Pierce, I'm, I'm vice president here at Northwestern, been here since, I hate to even say it, since 1965. But uh, at the time I was a news bureau director, I was teaching some journalism classes. My name is Dan McDonald. At that time I was a student here at Northwestern, a sophomore majoring in journalism. I graduated here in 75. He came back as the sports information director in 1976 when Jerry Pierce hired me back and I was here until 1980 when I took the same job at what was then Southwestern Louisiana, now the University of Louisiana Lafayette. That day was pretty much for me like any other day. I was the sports editor of the, uh, the campus paper, The Current Sauce, and we had a remarkably talented group of student journalists. Uh, Melanie Babin was our features editor. She was the one who had the opportunity to do what became the last interview with Jim Croce. At the last kind of minute that day, and I really wasn't planning to go to the Jim Croce concert because I really didn't care that much. A friend of mine who worked for the Student Union Governing Board and worked with the concerts called me and said, we've got an opening, Jim Croce's gonna be here, and would love to have somebody from the current sauce come and interview him. And so he called me and I said, well, okay, yeah, I can do that. It was just a little kind of empty cinder block room and um, we were sitting in uh, uncomfortable metal chairs and he was there with a couple of people from his entourage and um, it was just kind of a little of a, a little nervous time for me since I was young and really hadn't had time to prepare. I asked questions like, you know, what was your, what's your favorite music? What do you think about Natchitoches? He was just beginning to rise as a, as a really recognizable rock star. And uh, he had been to Europe and they had, he had covered something like, he said, I, I've traveled like, I've flown 500,000 miles, 700,000 miles in the last several months. He said, I'm tired. Um, he had a, a wife and a child then, and so he was kind of eager to get back to them. I went to the concert, my son, my son wanted to go to the concert. You know, we've had all kind of, in those days, we could, we could get a lot of musical acts. And, you know, we had Neil Diamond and John Denver and, 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 you know, just on and on. It was just, we had just about every big name there was, because in those days you could get them for a few thousand dollars. Now we couldn't afford any of those people, you know, but, um, so the, he told me that, that Jim Croce was coming, and I said, well, now, I, who is Jim Croce? And he said, well, he, he does Bad, Led, Bad, Bad Leroy Brown, and we'd all heard that song on, on the radio in those days. We didn't walk in on time, and uh, the comedian was already, uh, George Stevens was his name, and he was already into his warm-up by the time we got there. And you know, then the concert came, and. And it was short, but he had all of the recognizable hits and a few. His album was scheduled to come out in the very near future, his next album. And he played some cuts off that, but it was very short. And, you know, it was sort of obvious that, you know, trying to get this show over with, trying to get this tour over with, and from what I read from Melanie's story later, that, you know, he was ready to go home. He wanted to end this tour 
and never got the chance. concert. I, I liked the guy. We, we really enjoyed the show and it, it got over pretty early, you know, probably 9, 30, 10 o'clock, maybe, maybe not that late. So we went home and, and an hour or so later Norm Fletcher called. Norm Fletcher was a guy who, who was a radio voice here for the university. When I got home, the two guys who I was sharing a house with uh, met me at the front door and said, Norm Fletcher called and he wants you to come to the airport and he wants you to come there right now. Uh, took me a little by surprise, uh, but it took me, it didn't take very long to figure out, uh-oh, something has happened, and there were not that many flights in and out of Natchitoches. There were not that many flights in and out that time of night. Uh, I sort of started gathering in my mind what I was about to see. Pulled up at the airport, and already, you know, flashing lights everywhere. I could still walk out onto the airport because you know, it wasn't, you know, there was not a lot of security at that time, nothing like now. You can't just walk out on an airport now. At that time you could, but everything that was happening was not at the airport proper. It had all happened at the end of the runway, obviously. So I sort of started slogging my way out there and I ran into Norm and by that time I had figured out what had happened. We, we go up to the scene and and it was an, an awful scene. They, the, the, the airport was dark. They, they, didn't, they took off in a direction that didn't have proper lighting or something, and the, the plane uh, hit, a, a little, hit a pecan tree at the end of the runway and toppled over onto the, onto the highway, and, uh, and of course everybody was killed instantly there. I'd, I'd never seen anything like it. Um, I was a sophomore in college. I hadn't, you know, I hadn't seen a lot of accidents and so forth and it just looked like a bomb had gone off. I mean, there were pieces of airplane strewn about. I remember vividly seeing a piece of a wing up in a tree. Um, and it was just something that, I mean, I, I had hoped I would never any, ever see anything like that, and I hope I never do again. It was a terrible scene with stuff scattered everywhere. And to be honest, you know, we walked up to the, to the main part of the, the plane there where the, the, the bodies were, but I, I didn't want to spend much time looking at that, but there was, there was wreckage and debris, you know, for 50, 60 yards around, around the site. We, we walked through some of it. We saw that they still had all of the luggage and the, um, there was his shoe. His shoe was right there, you know, at the crash site on the tarmac there. And it was, it was just sad to think that that had happened. It happened here, you know, for a concert. And it, uh, it just struck me as such an ending, such an ending for, you know, for what happened. And I was a sophomore in college. I mean, I was a long way away from being an experienced journalist. But, you know, we sort of, you know, followed the lead of people like Jerry Pierce and Norm Fletcher and several others who were there on scene. And, you know, we, we started, you know, acting like the reporters that we were. And it was a... Uh, it was traumatizing, but it was also educational. Uh, you again hope you never see anything like that, but now that you're involved, well, you sort of click into that mode. Um, I mean, I had no idea that that was going to be how I ended that day on that September 20th. It's just that death happened out there to those people and even the people who, you, who nobody remembers their name, like the comedian and the manager and everything. I mean, they were gone too. I think it was the first time I was ever involved in real journalism. Um, I was a sports editor for the paper. I grew up, you know, taking part in sports. I grew up covering sports. I did radio, did TV, and so forth. And, you know, that was sort of the niche I had. And it was, you know, sports is fun and games. This was real. And I had never really been involved in a real, real story. 
uh, until that night at uh, Natchitoches Airport. And I, I think I sort of grew up an awful lot that night. And the first thing I thought of selfishly was I had to tear up the front page and do it all over again. And at some point, Melanie and I got together and we, we used our police cards, our car ID cards to go out to the crash site. I just added a little bit of the stuff that we got from the police and the university officials. And we decided to put the story above the fold. I mean, that's the best you can do when you're doing a print thing is put it above the fold. So we put that story up there with the picture. But there were so many places that we didn't think would ever be calling us on that little phone in Warren Easton wanting to talk to Melanie about that last interview. And so we, we knew it was, well, it was our, we always said it was our first big story was Jim Croce's death. I hate that he died, but it was the first big story that we covered. Jim Croce puffed on a little cigar and strummed his guitar as he talked of his recent TV appearances his favorite performers and the tiredness he was feeling after so many one-night concert stops. His final interview took place in a football dressing room at Prather Coliseum. I just really think it was a laugh that ended way too soon or we would have heard a whole lot more out of Jim Croce, you know. And I also remember something I read later uh, that he told his wife in the, the famous letter that he had written to her a few days before all this happened at one of his other stops that said, you know, the, the, the first 60 years are the most important and I've got 30 more with you. <sighs> I do get a little emotional about it because again, I had, I had never been involved in a, a scene like that, especially one that I was not prepared for. The tragic thing that, that, it, that it ended here because I think he had such a brilliant career in front of him. I wasn't a Jim Croce fan before I went and did the interview, uh, but once, once the tragedy happened and I learned more about him and his uh, talent and his career, I uh, had a new appreciation for what he was doing, and a hard-working guy, apparently, came up from nothing. He had a song on one of his albums called Roller Derby Queen, and I would hum that. It was, it was something very different. It, was, uh, it, was, it sort of described him. It, just, it described a hard knocks woman, and he was a hard knocks guy. He had grown up in Philadelphia, and his, his songs were all true to life, true to that kind of hard scrabble life. And, and that song just struck me. The night that I fell in love with a roller derby queen, round and round, oh, round and round, meanest hunk of woman that anybody ever seen, down in the arena. That's the best, that's the best I can do. <laughs> and I'll have to add this. When I got married three years after that to a friend who um, I met at Northwestern. Anyway, we got married in Jonesville and I had the piano player during the wedding play um, Time in a Bottle. And so I brought that piece of music with me. But I had to go buy the, I remember buying the sheet music in Houston when we were planning our wedding. And it was just such a lovely song and it seemed to speak to uh, love and devotion and I thought it was appropriate for a wedding. I've had all of his recordings since then. I, he, what a great talent. The you know, guy was 30 years old, and I think he would have been a, been a superstar. You just find yourself in the moment, and um, it's exciting, it's sad, it's uh, kind of stunning. It, uh, you know, is something I will never forget, and other people have remembered that too, and it's sort of... Um, kind of an odd thing in your career when you interview someone and they subsequently very quickly die after that. Well, you know, it, it didn't have a lasting impact other than the fact that things can change on a dime. And, you know, like his, uh, his song, Time in a Bottle, you know, if you, could, if you could take all your time in a bottle and know how much time you have, how would you live it? 
Well, I guess if I could save time in a bottle, I would, I would, I would save the time about 40 years ago when I was able to play tennis and do all the things I wanted to do, you know, and have a good time. Words could make wishes come true I'd save every day like a treasure And then again I would spend them with you I would, uh, I would love to go back to the time when my children were small and savor those moments a little bit more. I looked around enough to know you're the one I want to go through time with. If I could save time in a bottle, I'd give it to my daughter. I missed a lot of years with her because of what I did, because of my chosen profession. Uh, I needed to give her that time and if I had it to do again that's what I would give to her they were answered by you but there never seems to be enough time to do the things you want to do once you find them I looked around enough to know if I could save time in a bottle, I would just cherish every moment I have on this earth. Big the newspaper was. I know. It's a real newspaper. Yeah, yeah. a real newspaper. Yeah.